rated T for Teen. Hello and welcome to GaiaCast, a spoiler-filled deep dive podcast into the world of Horizon from the team here at Gorilla. We're looking forward to diving into the lore, hearing some behind-the-scenes anecdotes, and maybe even learning some new things. Our first series of episodes will be focusing on Horizon Zero Dawn, the first instalment of the Horizon series, which we launched in 2017. I'm Shante, and I'm joined by my co-host, Anna. Hey, Anna. Hi, it's great to be back. Brilliant. And also, we have our two guests today. Please introduce yourselves. Uh, yeah, so I'm Annie Katane. I'm a senior writer here at Gorilla, and I'm part of the narrative team. Hi, my name is Arno Smits, and um, I'm a principal character artist. And back then, I was a senior character artist uh, on Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah. This episode, we're diving into the tribes, the different groups of civilizations around the Horizon franchise. We come across many of them throughout Horizon Zero Dawn, including members of some we haven't had a chance to fully engage with just yet. I'm really looking forward to this episode. How about the rest of you? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get started. So in Horizon Zero Dawn, we meet various tribes. Uh, How does the team approach like designing these? So from a visual perspective, we started out with this very huge like flowchart based on what we got from narrative. Uh, So we kind of divvy up the tribes in a few different categories. For example, how technologically sophisticated they are, how cultural they are, how rich they are in terms of natural resources, what landscape they live in, all these type of things. And all those uh, narrative points kind of influence the design. And we really try to come up with logical hooks on how that kind of transitions into a solid visual design. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing that's really interesting is, you know, once we start to see some of the art that's coming back, that does, you know, inform and inspire uh, future developments, you know, as we sort of, sorry, sort of flesh out uh, the rest of the tribe and and their backstory. Yeah. 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 And how did the different tribes come about, you know, like splitting up in the story and defining their own uh, different cultures, fashions and uh, religions? Yeah, um, so, you know, all the tribes that we meet in Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, they all started from the same uh, cradle facility. So, you know, after the world ended, uh, Gaia was made as the terraforming system to sort of repair the biosphere and and bring life back to the Earth. And part of that plan was to uh, reintroduce humans eventually. Uh, And so, you know, things went a little wrong with Ted Farrow messing with the Apollo database. Um, But... Eventually, humans were reintroduced into the wilds, and at first, you know, they stayed pretty close to home. We have the Nora who who, who just stayed around uh, the cradle, and they eventually revered it as this this sacred mountain, as all, an all mother, uh, believing that's the goddess within it. Uh, whereas some of the other tribes, uh, you know, they eventually migrated outside of the sacred lands. We have the Karja, uh, who it's very part of their their history and their backstory how they how they left. Uh, and then, you know, we have the Banuk, the Osram, even the Tanakh, the Nutaru out in the Forbidden West. They originated from from this place as well. Yeah, the first tribe we come across, of course, as a player is the Nora tribe. How could would you describe uh, the Nora tribe from Aloy's perspective? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Aloy, she grows up as an outcast of the Nora tribe and uh, she experiences sort of the brunt of their extremism in terms of how they treat outcasts, how they view someone who's not part of the tribe. Um, So, you know, she has a pretty complicated history. Uh, You know, she'll always feel very strong connections to the tribe because of uh, it's, you know, it's tied to her origins. But uh, at the same time, she has a lot of, you know, feelings about how, about their traditions, about their laws and how they, how they treat others. Um, balanced with, you know, you have characters like Rost and Tirsa mm-hmm. and Varl. Yeah. These are people that are trying to better the tribe and, uh, you know, she she respects them, she likes them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's a bit of both. Yeah. Yeah, and after leaving behind the Nora tribe, uh, after she's b- basically being treated as, as an outcast her whole life, which tribe does Aloy kind of um, has closest affinity to after that? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, partly she'll always be Nora, and and part of that is, you know, like her iconic look of her character design Mm -hmm. has that Nora outfit. 
Uh, and and like I was saying, she she has that that history with them with with her origins, uh, but she really you know especially after the proving and, and as she explores more of the world, she doesn't really have a tribe right. She's someone who belongs to the world in yeah. a lot of sense. You know she she meets a lot of these tribes through her journey and uh, she sees the good in them, the bad in them, and and she's always gravitating towards. The, the people she wants to help in these yeah. tribes rather than the tribe as a whole. Yeah, definitely. And during the Frozen Wilds, we spend some time with uh, the Banuk tribe. Uh, is this a tribe that Aloy somewhat understands or relates to thanks to her, her Nora upbringing or does she struggle to fit in with them too? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the Banuk, they are up in the frozen north. Um, so they're shaped by the land they're in. Uh, you know, it's very cold. It's very extreme. They value survival at almost any cost. Uh, and so Aloy sees, you know, some of that uh, extremism and and that's similar to what she's experienced with the Nora, but in very different ways because the Nora, it's all about their religion and the Banuk, it's more about survival. Um and because of her her outcast upbringing, she does have that sort of anti-traditional view. And you know, just because something is is the law, and that doesn't mean that it's it's necessarily right or the the best thing. And so she she does butt heads with with the Banuk in that way. Um, but at the same time, you know, she meets characters like Aurea and Aratak, and you know, you can see in the Frozen Wilds, like at first, she's really you know, kind of going against our talk and they have this friction between them. But by the end of it, they form this friendship and this bond and she really respects him. So there's a there's a balance there. And the Banuka Nora tribes are quite distinct from the other tribes that we see in the game. How mm-hmm. did the team approach designing them as they look quite similar, but also they have their differences? Yeah. Well, so the main thing you're thinking about is where are they living? Because they're both kind of hunter-gathering tribes, that kind of this describes the Nora perfectly, but uh, the Banuk also do a lot of hunting. So all the ingredients that make up their costume pretty much need to be kind of sourced locally. Mm-hmm. For example, one of the most interesting things is with the Nora, you have a lot of leather there, but there are no large animals in the world of, world of Horizon. So we can't have like cows, for example, to yeah. have leather. The biggest things we have are like a boar. So you can see that the uh, Nora have these interesting patchworks of clothing, for example. So that's really nice. And then we also try to think a lot about their role in the complete tribe. So if you see like a lineup of Nora, they all kind of have the same leather, kind of torso usually, and some kind of fabric for the pants. But then, of course, you also want to introduce robot pieces because hunting is a big part of their culture. And you'll see that the um, Nora hunters still actually use pieces of the robot to to be like armor mm-hmm. and it's very rudimentary like stitched to them and you can very clearly see usually what part of the robot it belonged to mm-hmm. uh, and this is really something the hunters gather themselves so if you look for example at the children or the mothers that stay behind in the village they have like zero to none robot parts on their costume usually and the matriarchs uh, which are like the, the highest member in the tribe they often get gifted nice robot pieces, so they usually have some type of robot piece in the helmet. And then another big element that's part of them is the the kind of crochet and the knitting uh, aspect of it. You can see the people that stay behind in the town, they have more time to do these type of activities, to make these very very labor-intensive wool shawls and other things you see on the Nora. So you see those more on the the mothers and then again, the matriarchs had gifted these type of things to kind of embellish their costumes. That's really interesting. I didn't know that they were gifted, uh, those pieces, like the matriarchal figures. I I don't know where I thought they got them uh, from, but it's interesting that they were gifted to them. Well, I don't think it might be explicitly explained, but I kind (laughs) of remember like when when we are creating this stuff, we kind of also make like stories of it ourselves to how like, like how why is this happening mm-hmm. yeah so we kind of feel like the the mothers in the town they have a lot of time to do these type of activities and like uh, since the matriarchs get her so much respect like that's kind of how they they get these impressive garments over time that's really cool now i have this image in my head of like tirsa trying to go out and hunt machines <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that makes sense. um annie how would you uh answer the same question but from a narrative perspective you know the Banu uh, Nora tribes they're distinct from others in the game uh, due to their religious beliefs their uh, matriarchal figures uh, 
do you think these tribes are similar and do they have uh, what are their why, why are they so different from the other tribes in the game yeah i mean so i kind of touched on this already a little bit but you know the what aloy sees in them of, of what's similar is that extremism of for the Banuk, it's survival. For the Nora, it's uh, you know the the idea of clinging to to their religion and to the idea of all mother and and how strict they are about staying in the sacred lands. Um, so I think in in that way they're they're very similar, not in terms of the actual specificities <laughs> of uh, of what they believe in, but just the way that they approach that. Um, and I think you know all of the tribes, not just the Nora and the Banuk, but they are a product, like Arnold was saying, of the land that they're in and how what their relationship is to that land and to the machines that inhabit it. So, you know, everywhere you go, everywhere Aloy goes, uh, the tribes have this central, each tribe has a central conflict uh, that that's developed for them. Um, and for the Banuk, it is, you know, that survival at any cost. And for the Nora, it is the religious fundamentalism and clinging on to those beliefs. So I think that's where a lot of the similarities come into play. Um, but yeah, each tribe has their specifics that make them different. Yeah, I don't think we really touched that much about what makes the Banuk that special. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the specific names anymore, <laughs> but in the backstory, there's something about uh, one of their founding members or like one of the... How oh, you call yeah. it? Like they yeah. have the, they have this backstory with with one of the early members having something with the skin being penetrated with the cables. Mm -hmm. So that's something we bring back in like all the all the shamans, like all the, these Banuk shamans. Is, they have this very interesting design element of robot cables running to the to their skin, which is a bit like weird, but ends up looking super cool. Yeah, uh, it does. <laughs> so this is all, almost like a founding story that they kind of keep yeah. repeating. Yeah, actually, um, so the, the tribe, the Banuk, they're named after their their founder, uh, Banukai. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, they have, they believe in songs and they, they sing these songs and, and that's one of the most important ones to them is the story of Banukai and how uh, she went up north and, and found the, the light, the blue light of the machines. Mm -hmm. So you can see in general, there's a lot more respect uh, for what happened in the past and like a very sense of culture because also for the Nora, they tend to wear their robot pieces in a very practical sense. They yeah. just take what they have and they use the holes that are existing in the robot pieces. They don't modify them and they just kind of wrap things around. While the Banuk, they kind of, you know, they choose their robot pieces. They usually tend to make these kind of animal skull shaped helmets. It's very theatrical and they also have the the blue ropes hanging everywhere all to kind of have a sense of showmanship almost, yeah. you know. That was one of the, you know, when I was playing the game, uh, when you're in Meridian for the first time, uh, you see a lot of Karja uh, there, but then there's like this one Banuk who's hanging mm -hmm. out and he just has this such distinct, just the blues of his outfit uh, are just so distinct that you're like, yeah. there's there's something different about this guy. <laughs> yeah. And, and same like that, we try to pick color palettes that are from the environment. So in general, the Banuk are very like icy blue. Yeah. That's based on the mountains. The browns that they use in their costume are very desaturated because they're based on rocks and the mountain colors mm -hmm. and not on any warm uh, brown colors you would see. And then they have these very interesting lakes that ha in the area that have this kind of gradient of very vibrant Stunning. colors. Yeah. yeah. So that's something they use in their costume as well. So it kind of connects them better with their environment. Yeah. <laughs> So as a player, we're now traveling into Meridian and you can already like get a really big sense of like how big the world of Horizon Zero Dawn is. And here you meet two new tribes, of course, the Karja and the Osaran, and they are living peacefully together over there. So how would the team uh, go about designing these tribes? Mm -hmm. like, okay, so the most interesting aspect about these two tribes is that they're both the most technologically advanced kind of tribes we have, at least seen so far. And, um, but the Karja, they have a very big sense of hierarchy. You have like the king and the priest. There's even a much stronger sense of religion in that tribe. And all this reflects in their costume. They want to see kind of at a glance who's important and who's not. So the main thing about the Osram is that they can um, forge their own metals. So that's like a really big part of their identity. So they wear a lot of letters to protect themselves while they're doing this activity. 
and those letters, they're not that well maintained. There's like soot and everything on mm -hmm. it. Yep. And also just the fabrics they're wearing, their linen, they're very, um, compared to the cards, they're very simple materials and they're a lot more sturdy as well. You know, everything is kind of made to be super practical. They don't want to have to deal with rips and things in the middle of it. So they prefer their materials to be like nice and strong so yeah. they can just keep going about their day. Yeah. And how do the team actually approach balancing the outfits like style versus function? Because we know that the cards, they are, you know, particularly stunning. Yeah. But when they go into uh, like war fights, their outfits are still practical. Mm -hmm. So how does the team go about doing that? Okay. I think one of the most interesting things we had for the cards is in-house we had like a gradient. So we have like a, a triangle of the hierarchy pretty much with the king at the top and the peasants at the bottom. And if and we lined every concept up in that hierarchy and you could very clearly see also the access to nice materials every like class has. So the, the peasants, for example, they don't have um, very nice linens and also they don't have any nice dyes really. So they still respect all the, the shape language of, of the Karja. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be something interesting to talk about the, the shape language of it. So because they live up on these on these high mesas, they kind of get inspired by, by their environment and mainly the robot birds, right? So if you kind of take one of the feathers of those robot birds' wings, it has like this interesting elongated hexagon shape. Mm -hmm. So if you pay close attention, you're going to see that everywhere on all the, the Karja outfits, no matter rich or poor. But the treatment of it very much changes on the, the class where they are. And then when we go to the more military aspect that you were kind of asking about, I would say the Karja, they have much more artisans. So in contrast to the Nora, which we talked about earlier, they actually edit robot pieces, you know, to make them fit nice. And also they, due to trading, they have a lot more access. It's not like uh, the soldier picked a robot piece that, that he uh, found himself, you know, he just traded it. So you see a lot of patterns, like repeating same robot pieces on, on Karja characters. And I think that also makes them look so stunning. It's very nice to see that. So we meet many members of the, the Karja and the Osram tribes uh, who stand out from the rest of the world of Horizon for various reasons. We've got people like uh, Sung King Avad, who have already talked about, uh, Vanasha, Neil, Gildan, Petra, just to name a few. Uh, were these characters created knowing which tribe they'd be a part of or are they assigned like during development? Are any of them originally meant to be part of another tribe? Okay. So as far as I remember, they were always intended to be the tribe that they were in the final product. But what we did do during the production a lot of times is uh, because we need to start way earlier than story to kind of have the, the final nice looking models in the game that we end up with. We kind of just take characters from the from the tribe, like classes, we would say. Um, so if you take, for example, Vanasha, who you mentioned her, and we have a class called Karja Noblewoman. So she would probably just be a Karja, Karja Noblewoman with a specific face. And then later we'll replace her with the specifics. So some more easier examples would be like Rost, which is essentially just a Nora Hunter. And so that's pretty much how he's being represented during most of the game's production. And then once story has done its pass, we'll see what's special, what makes him unique. Like he's an outcast, he's kind of big, and we're gonna make a new character based on those like identifiers. And that, that's what's gonna be the final product in the game. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's what's really interesting, like from our perspective, you know, when we get to creating a character, um, we really look at, you know, their backstory, what role they need to fill in the story, uh, and and that's intrinsic to to their tribe. Like they, I don't think we have a single character who was developed uh, without their tribe in mind because that's so tied to to who they are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> examples being, you know, Sun King of Odd, mm -hmm. as we mentioned, you know, he his role in Horizon Zero Dawn and who he is as a person that really is tied to being uh, the Sun King. And, you know, he couldn't be anyone else besides that. Uh, or as someone like Petra, who is a tinker, she's, you know, she's very inventive and creative. And that's so specific to the Ostrom mm -hmm. tribe uh, that, you know, that's the only tribe she could ever be. Mm. 
I was just thinking about how much I love Vinash's outfit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's just dressed so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the Kaja, they seem to be the most advanced of the tribes, uh, thanks to their, you know, their kingdom. We also see, like, the elevator, which is so unique to, to that tribe, uh, although they do seem to have some misinformed beliefs. Uh, what has set the tri- uh, Kaja tribe uh, aside from, say, uh, the Banuk? Yeah, I mean, so so this ties in really well to to their history and how they came to be. Uh, so the very first sun king, actually, Araman, he discovered this uh, book, this physical book that somehow survived from the old world. Uh, and, and in that book, it had, you know, pictures of the architecture. Uh, so, you know, that's, I think, what were some of the designs for Meridian, or at least for the Karja, that's where they're inspired from. Um, it it talks about, you know, observing the sun and it just gave them a lot of information and gave them a head start uh, as they were setting out uh, from their, their original lands where the Nora were. Uh, and that eventually, Armand eventually led all these people t- and discovered the spire, uh, which, which is at Meridian. And so, you know, bet- between that discovery and sort of finding the spire, settling in the area of Meridian, which happens to be really great farmland. So it, you know, gave them that edge of now they have a great land, they can they can put down crops and, and really reap the benefits from that. Uh, it just kind of gave them that edge uh, pretty early on. So you were talking about it already a little bit, uh, how the Osiram tribe is really practical, uh, especially compared to the other tribes. And they also seem to be quite uh, not not following religion as much as the other tribes. And Annie, can you tell a little bit more from the narrative side, how, why are they so different? And and is this why Aloy has such a such a good friendship with Aaron because of this? Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, this is tied really closely to the tribe's uh, history and how they ended up where they are. Um, so the Osram, you know, they eventually left the area around the cradle and they went out uh, to the area that's now known as the claim. It's mm-hmm. very, uh, there's a lot of forest there. Um, and I think one of the key discoveries for their tribe was discovering uh, the ability to to use charcoal burning for fuel because mm, yeah. uh, that eventually led to them uh, creating forages and, and what we know them for today. Um, so I think that's that's really what makes them different and what sets them apart. And the practicality side of it just comes from, you know, their experience navigating through the world and, and ending up where they are. It's it's also interesting with the Osram because their core conflict uh, for their tribe is their struggle with with gender and and how they treat uh, women mostly, um, and so actually a lot of women uh, Osram leave the claim for that reason. You know they they don't have the same rights as the men there. They have this clan tribal culture uh, that's very patriarchal and pat- patriarchal mm-hmm. <laughs> and. Um, Yeah, so so that's that's their struggle, and and even though they 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 appear the same, and and that's nice to see in in their in their character designs, uh, you know, from the narrative standpoint, that's that's really a big uh, struggle for their for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what about Erend? Yeah, um, so you know, Aloy and Erend, I think it has a little bit less to do with the tribe uh, specifics, but mm-hmm. more to do with you know when Aloy. Meets Aaron in Meridian, he's really grieving for his the loss of his sister. Um, and her helping him with that, uh, you know, really creates that friendship between them. Um, and so, you know, Aloy is always looking to help whoever is in need. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't have anything, not too much to do with their tribe. So in that respect, you know, I think the friendship between Aloy and Aaron, it's a very strong friendship, mm-hmm. um, but not too much tied to to who the Osram are as a whole. And going back to, you know, these tribes, their histories, uh, following the success of ending the the Mad Sun King's reign, uh, where members of the Kaja and the Osaram work together, uh, what kind of relationship do these tribes have with each other now? Yeah, so, I mean, you can kind of see it in Horizon Zero Dawn already. Um, you know, the war has been over for a couple of years and... Um, The Osram and Karja, they've always had a, a sort of close relationship and often, you know, sometimes it's through trade, sometimes it's through subjugation uh, that the Karja do towards the Osram. Um, but, you know, we're reaching a point where there's this new era of peace that's that's really led by Avad. Um, and one example of that is the rebuilding of the elevators in at Meridian. Like you, you mentioned that before, and that's you know what makes the city look so unique. And that's that really is an example of the 
Karja working with the Asram or the Asram helping the Karja. Um, but at the same time, you know, the scars of war just don't go away overnight, right? So there are plenty of people, of especially the Asram, the, you know, during the Red Raids, the Karja raided all of the tribes in the surrounding area. Uh, and the Asram were hit particularly hard. So even though there is this new era of peace and this new uh, want at least and push from Avad to to move past that, there is still lingering issues of, you know, the Karja committed atrocities for, for years. So they're they're dealing with that. Okay. And let's say Aloy has to describe the Karja in three words. What would she say? Uh so I'm going to paint a little bit in in broad strokes because, you know, I've been mentioning how Aloy gravitates towards certain people. So she wouldn't feel this way towards, you know, like Avad or, or T- Talana or, or Vanasha. Uh, but I would say, you know, religious, um, reactionary because of, of their past and they're still pretty conservative in some ways uh, and uh, extravagant because, you know, Aloy grew up as an outcast. And, lavish. <laughs> yeah, lavish. I mean, she, when she gets to Meridian, it's like, whoa, this, there's all these colors, all these fabrics. It's it's so much more than what the, the Nora dress mm-hmm. as. Um, and what about the Asaram? Uh, for the Asaram, I would say practical, uh, inventive, you know, they're, they're tinkers. They, they have that spark of creativity um, and loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interested in learning more about the Tanakh and Utaru. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, so, you know, in, in Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, we already got a glimpse of a couple of these characters in, in a couple side quests. Uh, for the Utaru, you know, they uh, live in the Forbidden West along with the Tanakh. Um, and they're agrarians. They they mostly are you know interested in farming, uh, which makes them sound a little peaceful. But uh, you know this is still the Forbidden West, so <laughs> yeah. it's it's still dangerous, and they still have their own conflicts within the tribe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know the, one of the things that's interesting about uh, their their culture is they have this belief in in the cycle. So this is tied to their agrarian background, uh, and um, you know you you kind of see a little bit of this in with, in the character you meet in Horizon Zero Dawn when, with with. Uh, uh, Rhea, her name is, um, and she's trying to, she was captured during the Red Raids and escaped, whereas her her friend didn't make it. So she's come back to to lay her friend to rest, and that is, you know, tied to, to their beliefs. Uh, and then, you know, we have the Tanakhs, who uh, also are in the Forbidden West, and they're, you know, very fierce warriors. They are, um, you know, constantly in battle. And we've seen some teases of this already, I think, mm-hmm. in, yes. in the trailers. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, they 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 too are shaped by the land around them and their conflict with with the machines. And now we've seen like a little bit of the blight. Uh, so they they have their own struggles as well. Um, and you know, historically, they've had uh, like many of the tribes come into conflict with the Karja, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly most recently, at least during the Red Raids. Uh, We saw a a little bit of this actually during uh, the comic book with Mm -hmm. Talana. Um, You see a little flashback in in that where the Tanakh clans actually uh, unified and and slaughtered this Karja army that was pushing into the West. Um, So there's a lot of conflict for them. There's a lot of uh, intrigue with with their background as well. Yeah. Yeah, and Arno, how did your team uh, design these characters to yeah. look so different from the other tribes? I think the most interesting thing is that we already had a representative of these uh, characters of the tribe mm-hmm. for each of them. Yeah, and so that was like a big springboard. So for the Utaru, you can see like the the Aloy costume that has been shown in the last trailer. Mm-hmm. They have this very like kind of one with nature kind of feeling about them in their costume design. Yeah. So you can see the banana leaves in the in the costume, very nicely done. The original one uh, in Horizon 1 had this kind of uh, yellow with black pattern. So we kind of did a lot with those type of patterns in the kind of based a little bit on in- insects, you know, how they're also like a, like a beehive is like one with nature. Mm. So also how they are kind of harmonious with the, the robots. So a little bit of that. Yeah. And as far as, as their treatment with robot parts goes, uh, we didn't really explore the use of the remaining plates when you shoot, shoot it off. So um, the Utaru used those elements in very interesting ways on their design. So I think that's what makes the Utaru special, what's yeah. very interesting about them. 
And then for the Tanakh, we pretty much did the same treatment. So we took uh, what was there uh, shown in the in the first game, and we're kind of riffing on that and elaborating that a lot more. So we still have a lot of those fierce warrior aspects. So you can see this mainly in their body type. They're all super muscular. They have um, tattoos and, and paint, body paint everywhere, which is a big part of, of their tribe. And also what we explored in this time around is that these tattoos actually have meaning. So mm -hmm. like the more advanced the warrior gets, uh, the more elaborate the tattoos get. And every little section of the tattoo has like a, a story behind it. So like that's something to really flesh out uh, the tribe. And then as far as robot pieces go, we're doing a little bit more traditional, again, taking the robot pieces. But for example, in contrast to the Nora, which simply just strap them on uh, to kind of get the more warrior like feeling across, they kind of file in a lot. So there's like a lot of um, kind of sharp edges added to robot parts, which kind of adds to their aggressive nature. Uh, yeah. And what can the players expect from the Utaru and the Tanakh tribes as they venture out into the Forbidden West? Yeah, so, you know, Aloy's uh, journey and, and her quest to to solve the Blight, uh, that's going to take her into the Forbidden West where she'll come into contact with uh, the Utaru and Tanakh tribes. And, you know, when we were working uh, on the story and, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we had characters uh, who are not just interesting but have their own conflicts and, you know, things that, that Aloy can help them out with and, and form these strong emotional connections with. Um, so, you know... The Tanakh, we've touched on, like they're they're fierce warriors. They they have a very uh, interesting history and past, and and their relation to the world. Um, and similarly, the Utaru, you know, they they seem more peaceful, but they themselves have their own conflicts that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and and they do play, you know, both tribes play an important role in in her journey. And don't want to say too much, but <laughs> things to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I want to end on is that we just saw the tip of the iceberg for the Tanakh. So they consist of a number of subtribes, and they all have like vastly different looks, mainly based on the treatment of the tattoos and also their colors and other costume elements. Um, so yeah, they're really going to look spectacular, and there's mm. a lot more than what we've seen so far. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't want to get into spoiler territory too much, of course. So um, from all the tribes that, we, tribes that we've seen so far in Horizon Zero Dawn, which one was actually your favorite? Ooh, um, yeah, so, you know, for me personally, like, I just love the look of the Karja, you know, they, they look same. Yeah. They're so beautiful. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, from working on, on Forbidden West, you know, it's always fun to write for the Osirum because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just have, they're, they're the dwarves of the Horizon <laughs> universe. Um, but I would have to say, if I have to just pick one, uh, my favorite tribe is the Tanakhth um, mm. because of the way uh, their history works and how, you know, the specificities of how they, they relate to the world around them and yeah. the characters that Aloy is, go is going to meet and, and their stories and their struggles. Uh, the whole team just had a blast working on them, so... Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah, well, I have to link on with the Karja in terms of my favorite Aloy outfit. Mm. There's one uh, that I'll keep forever calling the Matador outfit. It's <laughs> the one with the orange and uh, purple. Uh, blazon? The, the blazon. Yeah. That's oh, the yes. actual name we shipped with. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that one's my, yeah. my favorite for sure. Yeah. And then uh, for the tribes in general, I'll go with the Banuk because... In terms of making them, they really have everything that, um, you know, makes doing like modeling a, a Horizon character like uh, exciting. They have like the really worn uh, letters. They got all the robot parts. They have really bright colors that are a lot of fun with texturing. So they're just like the complete package of like what's fun uh, about making a Horizon character. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would definitely agree. I think uh, for me, I would say the Kaja purely for the outfits. Yeah. Yeah. But when Pretty it comes aesthetic. to like their history <laughs> and uh, learning more about them, for me, I loved playing the Frozen Wilds and, mm. and visiting yeah. the Banuk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with that. <laughs> Why is nobody picking the Nora? <laughs> Maybe one of our listeners wants to share their love for the Nora. Uh, we're coming up to the end of this episode now. Thanks so much for joining us, Annie and Arno. Uh, how did you find today's episode? Oh, it was fun. You know, it's always fun talking about the tribes and going over all their differences and similarities. Yeah, I had a blast. It was really nice. Let us know what you think on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. 
You can also interact with us via hashtag Horizon GaiaCast. We'll soon return for a fifth episode where we'll be diving into the Eclipse and Shadow Kaja, two dangerous groups of enemies that have had a huge impact on Aloy's life. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Bye.